Hello there YouTube, Devin here again, and uh, today I have a video for you, like I told you, if you've watched my Pattern 51 web equipment uh, gear, uh, I told you if I ever got the compass pouch, I would show you the compass pouch. Now I don't have it on the equipment itself because there's actually quite a lot of different ways this could be used and worn, and I will put it on the web gear and I will show you how it is attached to the web gear and everything probably in a separate video. Um, but what I wanted to do is basically I'll show you the two kinds of compass that could have been used by the Canadian Army in, in World, uh, not World War II. Well, one of them is pretty much the same as World War II. And, um, but the Korean War is, so what we have here is basically the two variations, uh, used in the Korean War. And this first one here would have been like an early type of war thing through the late war. And then this one would have been kind of as the war dragged on, uh, what they would have got. Um, this is also U.S. Uh, this is like a U.S. style uh, compass pouch and carrier, and it uh, has lift the dot studs on it. They're still brass uh, of the World War II design, the black and brass, as you can see there. And uh, it uses kind of a fold over envelope style uh, to help keep water away from the compass. It isn't padded though. Um, unlike the Canadian one over here, and as you can see, this is a U.S. Uh, 1950s uh, dated uh, compass, December of 1950, and it is a mostly brass construction uh, kind of lensatic compass, as you can see there. Uh, it actually works uh, decently well. It's quite accurate uh, for this time. I am indoors, so uh, the thing about compasses is that uh, people say they don't really work well indoors, but they do. They work well indoors and inside metal buildings and tanks and stuff as long as they're calibrated for that. Uh, this one is just not calibrated for that. This one is a lot lighter than the uh, Canadian and Commonwealth, I should say Commonwealth version. Um, this is the U.S. version. It's pretty much identical to the World War II one. Um, has a lanyard here and everything like that as well as something to hold on to does have its uh, marker for uh, measuring out the distance and stuff like that. does have its little magnifying glass and its finder, as you can see there, if we line it up. So that way you can find uh, your mill marks and stuff like that. Uh, works quite well. It is adjustable. It does use a spring tension clip uh, to affect the degrees here in your mills. So it does not rotate backwards. It only rotates clockwise. Um, the... Commonwealth one works a little different. So this is the Pattern 51 compass pouch. Uh, it attaches a little different than the American version of the compass pouch. The American version of the compass pouch uses, uh, it can use a belt attachment as you can see here, although this is a quite narrow belt attachment, uh, and it can use uh, 1910 hooks, which means it does integrate with the Canadian 51 pattern web gear as well as all the American web gear of the era and future eras. The Canadian 51 pattern, uh, works basically as an identical copy of the Pattern 37, other than now it is green, and it has a blackened brass stud rather than a shiny brass stud. It can be attached uh, via the belt with these two loops, uh, or the normal attachment method was to route your brace uh, from your suspenders through here, your shoulder strap, through here, and then you would hook a pouch to the bottom of this, uh, usually in the officer's version. Uh, it would be the compass pouch, and it would sit uh, on your right or left brace or suspender there uh, for easy access, and it would be slightly higher up so you would know where it would be. And this pouch is uh, really nice. It is padded. It's lined with wool felt. This compass isn't actually probably one that would have been used in the Korean War. This is a late 50s manufactured one. It is identical to the World War II ones, though, other than the materials. This one is made out of stainless steel, whereas the World War II Mark III compasses would have been made out of brass. Uh, so, but during World War II, stainless steel was a commodity, so brass was a lot more easy to come by and cheaper to make and easier to work with. So this actually made a more durable, but uh, actually lighter compass overall than the brass ones. Has a rubber ring in it to keep it from skidding if you wanted to keep it stable on a table or something like that. Also has a retention lanyard. Uh, there is the manufacturer's marks and the NSN on it and stuff like that. Uh, it's made uh, Stanley London. And 
it works a little bit different from the US one. As you can see, it's uh, they're comparable in size as far as the face goes, but thickness is much different. This one is also like two or three times the weight. It is incredibly heavy compared to the US one. Uh, this one is also a little bit stiff as far as opening goes, and rather than having just a, a wire uh, like this one suspended in this thing, they actually do have a, a scribed uh, piece of glass there, which is why they had to... Uh, in World War II put these protectors on to keep people from breaking the glass because that line is very important for lining up your mill marks. Now this works basically just like the United, uh, the US compass. Uh, this little dial over here though, this screw uh, adjusts the tension that these two little prongs put on the knurled surface of this so you can rotate your, your mills as you see there. Uh, to achieve the proper angle you want. It uh, works out better because you could turn it multiple directions, which saves time, and then you have a way to like permanently lock it in place. Like you aren't gonna move it from accidentally bumping it or anything. Whereas the US one, even though while it does only turn clockwise, it's only held in by tension. So if you bump it good enough and something catches on that knurled surface, it will rotate, whereas that will not happen with this one. And then to achieve fine adjustment, you have a prism here so you can fold that over and you can use that to line up uh, if i can get the camera to see it here um probably not it looks like but there is a oh there it is you can see that in there it's not going to focus uh probably too well because the prism in there but that allows you to adjust uh behind that little point there would be the lines on the compass there as you can see these very very small little mill lines degree lines on the outside of the compass those would be inside this prism though there you go you can kind of see them spinning there in the video and that little point up there allows you to finally dial in your mill marks and your degrees and once again there is a channel to cut in here to acquire that wire while you're looking down it so you make sure you're pointing straight on at accuracy and you have everything nice and level this is a very accurate compass and this is one that I actually use a lot um, because it's just really durable and you're not going to break it. Uh, the, the lid on it is very stiff. It is also held in with tension clips as you can see here. Uh, replacement parts can be found for these quite easy as far as the way of little bits go as far as screws and things. You can still find replacement parts for these and they are into interchangeable with most of the Mark III's although the uh, inside of the stuff is very hard to do. Uh, this also, if you happen to have one, this is removable. It's just a case, as you can see here. So if you can actually take the compass out of its case uh, by pushing on this little thing right here. You can take a tool and you could push it out. If your compass was ever damaged but the housing was okay, you could replace the compass on the inside and it will accept the standard Mark III. Uh, as well. So this is actually, I think this compass here was made in 58, uh, which basically makes it identical to the ones that the uh, Canadians would have used, like I said, with the exception of this one being steel rather than brass, because uh, I don't have a Mark III and I'm not willing to shell out $300 for one. So uh, if one comes up in good condition, that's a a good enough deal but most of them you find are pretty beat up and they're like $300 and they barely read and you can't see the face whereas this one's in nice condition it's the same thing but in steel so but these are the two compasses that the Canadians would have used throughout the Korean War and probably later they are very very good uh, compasses both of these but it kind of comes down to whatever you want now I'd rather have this because this is a much nicer compass but in the end you're gonna know you get what you pay for and it's way more expensive to manufacture than this and in the end, that's kind of what happened to the Canadian Army. They were being a drag on the money and everything like that. And eventually they ended up with more U.S. equipment, e even in some cases later in the war, M1 helmets, uh, rather than the Canadian Mark III turtle helmets. So that was just something that happened. And that's why you can see them both using U.S. compasses and British Commonwealth-style compasses like this throughout the war. So hopefully you guys like this video and you subscribe if you like this sort of thing. I'm glad I could find another compass pouch. This stuff is getting very, very hard to find. And I'm glad 
uh, you guys stuck around for this. We're up near 1,000 subscribers, so thank you so much, you guys. Uh, I'm very, very glad this uh, channel has gone a lot farther than I ever expected it to, and I'm super, super happy for you guys, and I hope I'm making content you guys like. I do leave it in every description of my video, though. If you want to make suggestions for videos, go for it. Um, I haven't quite set up anything. I'm trying to work something out where you guys can send me stuff as far as pictures go, if you have any questions on anything, or if you have stuff you want me to do a video on and you're willing to send me or something you'd like to donate to the channel. It doesn't You don't need to necessarily send me something permanently, but if you wanted to send something um, to me that I could do a video on, I'd be more than happy to do that for you uh, if we could work something out in that regard. So thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.